Hi all, um, this is uh, Professor uh, Ian, just um, cutting in a special special um, video. Uh, I was catching up with some marking over the weekend, uh, last few days, you've probably seen that on Canvas. Um, I just finished looking through some discussion comments from the other week and uh, people's responses to the, the Roy Scranton essay. Uh, good job all around, everybody was engaged with both texts, it's, uh, it's really great to see. Um, I thought it would be a good time to come in and uh, address some of the comments people were making and some of the themes that are being um, uh, picked up on in both in both works. I'm ho I hope you saw the connection between the two. Um, so let's start with the, the Scranton essay. Uh, it's a challenging read, right? Um, Scranton, uh, Roy Scranton, he writes well. He's got a really, I think, a fun style, a very dramatic style. Uh, but he does assume that his audience is very familiar with some, some complex ideas, including uh, the work of uh, Frederick Nietzsche. Uh, not everybody is, of course. And he does move pretty quickly through a lot of uh, pretty complex ideas. I included his essay uh, in the reading as I think he pinpoints a vital point about post-apocalyptic narratives we need to think about, and especially about the road specifically. In the last few pages of the section you read last week of The Road, you read pages 1 to, to 58, uh, there's a flashback scene at the end of that, that, that section, like pages, I don't know, 56 to 58, um, where we learn that the boy's mother abandoned him and the father shortly after the world fell apart, and shortly after the, world, the boy's birth, right? Those things happen at the same time in the, the timeline of the novel. Uh, she made the decision to kill herself rather than go on living in this world that was totally destroyed, this, this barren wasteland that is the world of the road, right? She, you know, the, clearly she saw that the world had ended. There was no, the, the world was no longer what it was. And she decided to go off and kill herself rather than saw what she, suffer what she thought, saw as just like a, a struggle toward, a struggle and inevitable, you know, uh, being eaten by somebody or being the, the victim of other predators, right? That's what she saw as, as the fate. So she decided, in, in other words, um, uh, rather than go through that, that dark fate, she would just go kill herself. That's what she saw as the best al alternative. In other words, she gave into nihilism, right? Like that's what Roy Scranton is talking about in his essay, that we're, we're facing nihilism in our world, this belief in nothingness, that nothing matters, that everything we believed in has no value, right? And that's what the mother faces in uh, the road and she gives up she decides to take the the the, the suicide route she gave it in nihilism um but of course the, the the father the man in the book took another route okay so as we continue reading the novel we're going to encounter other people that have also given up and are destroying each other or themselves they're not trying to be moral uh beings in the world right in the next section it gets there's some pretty um some pretty dark stuff about this. Um, so they, they give up and they're, they're destroying themselves. They're preying on other human beings. Uh, on the other hand, the man and the boy, our protagonist, continue to struggle to maintain their moral code, right? So think about that scene in the first section of the book we read, pages 1 to 58, where the boy and the man encounter the burned man, the man who they think got hit by lightning or something like that, electrocuted, right? They, they, they come across this man. He's in terrible pain, terrible distress, he's, he's going to die, uh, and the boy wants to help him, right? The boy wants to stop and help him, but the man doesn't let him do this. The man says no and makes him continue, right? Because they don't have anything. There's nothing they can do for this person. But it's these moments in the book, right, where they encounter people that they, you know, they have these choices. What do we do? Like, what do we do when we encounter a person who's suffering? Even if we can't really do anything for them because we don't have anything, what do we do, right? So they have a little debate in the book, back and forth. The boy wants to help, the man doesn't. They continue on. And that's, you know, this is, these are these scenes in the book that present us with this, this moral dilemma. So, uh, you know, rather than giving into nihilism like the mother, right, she decided to kill herself because she believed that nothing mattered. The boy and the man are continually trying to figure out what does matter, what, what is important in this new world, okay? So, you know, in the Scranton essay, um, he's exploring this very impulse, Right? He claims that the world is, um, uh, in terms of a, a world ruled by humans, over. Right, Climate change, he claims, is going to kill most of the human population, and the survivors will live in a very different world. Right, Our time of ruling the world, uh, he uses that term, the Anthropocene, 
in the in the last paragraph, right? That means like the geological age where humans were the dominant species. He says that's coming to an end, and we need to reinvent how we live in the world um, in, a, in a very radically different way. Pardon me. And this is what we see happening in the world of the road. We see the world as we know it over, and the man and the boy, instead of giving up and just throwing up their hands and you know, uh, becoming predators and destroying each other or taking the, the route of the mother and killing themselves, we see the man and the boy trying to reinvent their moral code and go on in this very changed world, right? Trying to reinvent what it means to be human in a, in a world that doesn't favor humans in the same way, okay? So um, in your discussion comments, which were also uh, very, very good, I noticed a, a few repeated themes. So a number of people were understandably interested in what happened to the world, right? The world of the road. Usually when we're reading or watching a post-apocalyptic narrative, we get some kind of explanation, right? That's the usual pattern. We, because, you know, we want to know what happened. But in this book, that's denied us, right? We don't know what happened, what happened to the world, at least in the first 58 pages. And I think this relates to the other things people picked up on the, and things I was encouraging you to think about, like the archaic diction, right? The, the challenging vocabulary, uh, the lack of quotation marks, the lack of chapters, right? You'll notice there's no chapters. Um, there's just like scenes and then, you know, a, a bit of blank text and another scene. There's no, you know, connecting tissue between these scenes. There's no chapters, no chapter headings, right? Um, so there's nothing to help focus the reader on the different scenes and guide us through the narrative. Um, and, you know, I think this is, uh, I think this is important, right? Because there's a, there's, a, there's a world being created here in the world of the road, right? The world as we know it, uh, the pre-road world is over. There's this new world that is reflected in the book in terms of language, in terms of structure, in terms of the way we think about our relationship to the meaning of life and our daily struggle, right? So it's something to think about how he's trying to immerse you in a very different world, right? It is, and it can be challenging at first, the, the style, the lack of quotation marks, the, the diction, uh, it can be challenging, and some people pointed out they need to go back and reread certain passages, which is totally understandable. <clears throat> uh, I asked my uh, I asked my wife to also read the book um, just to give me her feedback, because she's she doesn't read as much as I do, and uh, she doesn't tend to read this kind of book. So I asked her just to read it to give me her perspective, because I thought it would be, you know, as as reading it the first time, I would get a fresh set of eyes, because I've read this book a number of times. And I wanted her feedback as, you know, as we're going through the book so I could, you know, understand maybe what some of you are thinking about the book as well. So anyways, my book, or my, my wife um, read the, uh, the first couple pages of the book or the first page of the book. And she looked up at me and she said, is the whole book like this? You remember that first scene with that dream with the, the weird creature in the cave? She was not very, uh, she was not very happy with that scene to begin the book. She read a few pages on and she said, Okay, now I understand what's happening. Why does he open with such an, uh, a hard issue? It's going to throw off all these readers. So again, I think we need to think about that. Like, why does he include such poetic and challenging passages mixed with other passages? Right? There's a there's a real um, again there's a there's a world he's creating here. We need to think about how and why he's doing that. Um, so the other thing I want to uh, talk about and it's related to this was and, and some people noted this in their comments as well is that the, you know there's a lot of vivid detail you can really picture some of the things that are happening I mean think of some of the scenes where McCarthy is describing the boy and the man setting up camp and having dinner or searching through the gas station right that's a really uh, good scene with a lot of vivid details right he catalogs every place that the man searches in the gas station talks about how he takes the you know the oil canisters and pours them all into one so that they have a one can one canister of oil it's, it's a lot of a lot of detail in that scene right where you can really picture um, the scene with the man looking through the gas station trying to find food and and tools for survival you can picture in a very cinematic way like you're watching a movie almost right and there's a lot of scenes like that we know what they have for dinner right they have like What's the one scene there, like canned peaches and, and mushrooms fried up in, in lard from a can of beans, right? I mean, we it's, it's uh, there's a lot of detail for some of these scenes. You can picture it very easily. And yet, on the other hand, we don't know where the story is set. We don't know what happened to the world. We don't even know the characters' names, right? We don't know what they did or the man did before, um, you know, the, the fall of civilization. We don't know any of this stuff. 
So it's it's also worth thinking about, um, you know, why are the, the why is in so, in some parts of the book or some aspects of the book there's so much vivid detail, right? Like this this daily struggle to survive. There's such detail about that. And the other hand, like things that we would think are important, like character identity, uh, background, all of these things, we don't get any access to, right? It's really interesting to think about why that is. It's almost as though some of these things don't matter in this world, right? Our identity, what happened before, none of this matters anymore in this world. What matters now is that you're having peaches and beans for dinner and that you're holding a piece of canvas over your head in the rain, that kind of stuff, right? Your, your daily survival. We might think about what that means for uh, the characters as humans, right? Does that, you know, that stripping away of things like identity, does that change what it means to be human in this world? Anyways, I'm going to just let you think about those things uh, and, you know, continue thinking about it as we go through the book, because the book is, uh, again, he continues with this kind of dual tone, right? So much detail on the one hand, such a lack of detail on the other hand. Okay, so that's it for now. I hope you're enjoying the book. Um, I hope you're finding it intellectually stimulating as well as an enjoyable experience. It's very dark, but uh, we'll see if it remains that way. Okay, do contact me if you have any questions or concerns, and uh, have fun uh, continuing to read the book. Goodbye.